Uh, Dear doctor, she writes, and I just want you to see this. I'm a little bit unorganized here. Um, started a little bit sooner than I thought it would, but here's some good ones. Wow. Okay, this is going to be good. Dear doctor, <clears throat> why is it when I ask you a question, do you take it as an insult? Why would you prescribe this to me if you don't know the possible side effects it may have? Why didn't you tell me about them? Uh, why do you have to look in a book filled with symptoms to diagnose me? <laughs> Why do you keep trying to find something wrong with me every time I come in? I come in for one thing and you find two more things wrong with me. Uh, why do you keep me waiting for answers? A laboratory test you drew two months ago has never been called to me. The results have never been. And folks, look, <clears throat> by the grace of God, I'm here with you today. I, I really believe I would have been a physician if not for the Vietnam War. I grew up in the 1960s, and so many of we guys got drafted. My draft, my, we were assigned, you guys know this, many of you who are older like me, it was a scary time in 1967, 68, 69, because so many, the military needed so many a buildup, so many men and women, a buildup uh, of the armed forces uh, ensued, and they assigned your birth date to a number. There are 365 days in a year, and so you got a number from 1 to 365. The guys with 300 beyond probably never got drafted. Mine was four. And uh, as I recall, it was four. It, it was one digit. My brother and I keep, it was one digit, and within two weeks I had a draft notice. Um, folks, I, I went into the military and lost, uh, I was first year college. I graduated from high school at 17, began college. I went to Santa Monica College out in L.A. <clears throat> and uh, lost years and years and years. And I was interested. I still don't think I'm smart enough. I, I really don't. I'll be honest with you. I don't think I have the IQ um, to have gotten through medical school. I question too many things. Did you see this article uh, two years ago about the young man in uh, some Harvard, I think, some big medical school? Brittany called. She said to tell you she still loves you. <laughs> Take care, Craig. Have, right, have a safe trip home. Um, and, and the young man was in medical school, and he said there's 160 students as you start medical school, and he said, I paid this much money. And then a professor got up, and he started ranting and raving, every patient needs statin drugs, yada, yada. This one, statin drugs were relatively new, maybe 10, 15 years ago. <clears throat> And the whole student body, the whole 160 kids went up in arms when this guy did his Google searches and found out that this doctor giving this course in medical school was not only on the board of the Harvard staff, I think it was Harvard, I better be careful, was on the Harvard staff, but he was also in the hip pocket of 10 drug companies, five of whom made statin drugs. That is cheating. That's a lie. That's not fair. You can't take advantage of these young, uh, impressionable minds when they're 19, 20 years old and tell them for money what they need to do. And by the by, folks, I'm going to jump on this bandwagon today. I don't think that's rare. I think medical schools continue to be educated by the pharmaceutical industry. To you and I, we'd have been spanked. We'd have been turned over our mother's knee and whacked, justifiably so, if we cheated that bad. In medicine, it's just okay. We need qualified PhD professors. And by the by, a PhD professor has never examined a patient. He can't. He's got a doctor of philosophy. And these are teaching our kids who are going to examine me it just blows my mind what's going on in medical school today. And so I really like what she wrote here. You know, why don't I have my lab results back? Why is your office rude to me? Why are you rude to me? And now I want to put myself in their shoes. And I, oh, I did have it. Hang on. Hang on. <clears throat> Dr. Hat. You know, Doug, I got to tell you, or Linda, I have to tell you. 
I had to spend $250,000. I had to stay awake two and three nights with gunshot wounds in the emergency room. I gave up a social life, dating, drinking, popcorn, everything, to get through medical school. I have four more years of college than most people. And uh, I need to tell you, it was good when I graduated from medical school. I did it because I wanted to help people. I really wanted to help people. I saw flaws in the system from when I was a baby. And I now realize grandma's kisses and mom's, you know, hugs and, and sprays on my arm when I got scratched, they were nonsensical. Real medicine requires a prescription and I'm a doctor. So why can't you talk to me? Why is it 11 seconds I get? Linda, I'm gonna see 55 more people like you today. I'll get home at 7 p.m. <clears throat> My wife, who is questioning why she would have married a doctor in the first place, is upset about this. I get to sleep six hours if there are no emergency calls, and then I go back tomorrow morning at eight o'clock to see 55 more patients. Are you not happy with that, doctor? To be candid with you, I was very excited about it. Now I'm blown out of the water, then why do you do it? There are so many doctors, there's 1.1 million doctors in America today. I have friends, look, I'm blessed. I now, uh, as you know, have stood in front of <clears throat> many doctors and lectured on fungus, and they believe me. And I know many of you do too. Um, folks, If here's the best thing I can tell you, really. In the world of the internet, it's just amazing that we can search in our little town, Dallas, Texas. It's so great that I can search for complementary or integrative physicians, and then before I'd ever, ever make an appointment with one, I'd call him. I can't talk to him because he's seeing 55 patients. I'd talk to his nurse and say, listen, does he take my insurance? Yeah, he does. Okay, good. I want to make an appointment. Can I ask you something? I think I have a fungal condition under my arm. Um, now, the nurse won't understand and the doctor won't understand. Does he treat fungus? Oh, yeah, he, he sees some fungus problems like the ringworm and vaginal yeast and tinea barbae, it's called, where some men can't shave because their face gets all itchy with fungus. And uh, many uh, scalp fungal conditions. Yeah, he sees those. Great. <clears throat> I'd probably then make an appointment, realizing that I'm going to be able to see him for a few minutes and realizing I need someone to do some testing on me to indicate fungus. Is my insomnia, is my depression, is this stomach problem, is this problem linked to fungus? So that's what I wanna teach you today. We the people, the preamble of the Constitution in America, those three opening words, not in the beginning, another good book that wrote that. Uh, we the people of the United States of America in order to form a more perfect union, yada, yada, yada. Um, so, are we owed more? That's all, are we owed more? And with third party or second party insurance payments now, it's almost like the insurance companies and the doctors are in cahoots. You don't have to be nice to them, just see them. Antibiotic caused hepatitis. A recent study has shown three commonly used antibiotics, erythromycin, tetracycline, and sulfonamide can cause acute symptomatic hepatitis severe enough to require hospitalization. When was this published? 1993, 26 years ago. Oh, well, billions of patients are on antibiotics and tetracyclines. Antibiotic therapy can increase the risk of breast cancer. Journal of the American Medical Association. 10,000 Dutch women were studied, including 2,266 who had breast cancer. As the number of prescriptions for antibiotics increased, so did the risk of deadly uh, I'm sorry, so did the a number steadily climb of breast cancer rates. The women who had more than 25 prescriptions for antibiotics filled over a 17-year follow-up period exhibited twice the incidence of breast cancer than women who took no antibiotics at all. Are our dietitians, are our nutritionists letting us down? L let me tell you the flip side of this coin. I've been blessed to have a wife who calms me the savage beast. I can't watch drug ads. I go crazy. 
when the organs start playing and the children are playing and the dogs are catching a frisbee and they happen to slip in. People have died from taking this. Some cancers are known to exist. You may experience horrible life-threatening diseases. But talk to your doctor because he'll give it to you and he will. My wife says, go with me. I know many of you think she's right and I do too. No doctor, Doug. Doug, I'm going to ask you to lay on my table. I'm going to hold your mouth open with this retractor, and I'm going to drop three of these pills in your mouth, your blood pressure medicine, your statin drug, etc. What in the world are you doing that for? That's my point, folks. There isn't one doctor who holds you down and makes you take that medication. You see, we are led to believe by our loving moms and our loving dads and our loving pastors that the answers are all in a doctor's office. Let me continue. <clears throat> Sometime, look, I want to read you these. This I pulled off the internet today. And by the way, I go to sciencedaily.com. Any of you can do this. January 2013, thousands of individuals have had their kidneys removed unnecessarily because doctors misdiagnosed their disease. You think that stopped in 2013? Thousands of individuals have had kidneys, thousands. Does it mean hundreds of thousands? Thousands of individuals, that's us, patients, have had their kidneys removed unnecessarily because of a misdiagnosis. Did you ask? to get a second opinion? Did you ask to send some of that tissue from your kidney, the punch biopsy, to a mycology lab to have it tested for fungus? Because I got to tell you, the kidneys filter the blood and the blood's loaded with candida sometimes and other fungi. Systemic mycoses, they're called, are known to exist. Gets into your brain, gets into your lungs, gets into your kidneys and liver, known to exist. Shh. Epilepsy or non-epileptic seizures. The misdiagnoses are common. It, the, uh, the word is misdiagnosis. I put the emphasis on that. That came out of Science Daily 2014. Many skin conditions are misdiagnosed by doctors as brown recluse spider bites. I worked in dermatology for several years, 30 some years ago now. I can tell you these doctors, you'd a patient would get up in the morning, now they live in spotlessly clean homes, and, you know, that, that's a spider bite, a brown, the poor brown recluse spiders. Man, they are blamed. How many of them are there in Texas? 14? They're blamed on every, everybody who's got a lump on their arm. Not, can I ask you something? Did you drink last night? Yeah, but, you know, in my past, I used to drink a lot. And then you quit for a period of time? Yeah, but I had two beers, a couple friends, eh, maybe three, four beers. A couple friends came over last night. You know, I ate something last night I haven't eaten in years and years and years. It's called corn, Q-U-O-R-N. I don't know what it is. The Hispanic uh, people eat it a lot, and they do. Q-U-O-R-N is fermented corn. It's the fungus off the corn. I had that last night. Went to a friend's house in that bunker. Nope, it's a brown recluse spider bite. Those poor brown... I wonder if they have brown recluse meetings where all the spiders, or they get uh, tiny cell phones yay big, and they all get, can you believe we're blamed for this? I'll bet you a hundred times a day a doctor has said, a dermatologist, that's a brown recluse spider bite. To wit, antibiotics are given you. Urinary tract and sexually transmitted infections in women are misdiagnosed by emergency departments nearly 50% of the time. Dementia treatment delayed due to misdiagnosis. One relative, uh, it is relatively common for doctors to diagnose someone with multiple sclerosis when the patient doesn't have the disease at all. It is relatively common for doctors to diagnose someone with MS when the patient doesn't have the disease at all. Okay, now you're hitting my territory. And then finally, this one from the UK nine years ago now, nine years ago. How likely is a misdiagnosis? The whole article, I read it carefully, it's never answered. 90%. Shh. It didn't say. What are the costs and consequences associated with misdiagnosing cellulitis? Any of you guys in boot camp? 
all of us in boot camp had cellulitis. You got those brand new stiff boots, you had to march and march and march and run on the sand and so forth, you know, back 100 years ago. We all had a break in our skin, little bacteria would get in, and man, we'd swell big. So, cellulitis is a common bacterial skin disease, and a new study suggests misdiagnosis of the condition is associated with unnecessarily hospitaliz unnecessary hospitalizations and antibiotic use, as well as avoidable healthcare spending. Cellulite leads to about uh, cellulitis leads to about 2.3 million emergency visits a year, many of which are not necessary. Hospitals are happy. Drug companies are happy. We're the only one not happy. The point I want to drive home, folks, is this. Misdiagnoses is not rare. Illness-induced, it's called iatrogenic. Illness-induced by their treatment or their pills cannot be blamed on them. I'm going to put my lawyer hat on now. Who held you down and made you take that pill? Do you know how many lawyers pharmaceutical companies have? Um, so caution must be exercised. Now, one more thing. I did a show. I'm doing all of these shows right now for God TV, and I'm so excited about it. And I read something in this book. John can, oh, I want to show first this. Someone's going to end up with this. Uh, Dr. Soraya once told me this is the way, this is our trilogy, the Fungus Link 1, 2, and 3, in a nice little, there you go, the, the trilogy, 1, 2, and 3, in a nice little enclosed package. These are brand new, never been opened. Somebody's going to get this today uh, just because I felt like giving it to somebody as a way of thanking you guys for joining me. Here's a book. <clears throat> this book is called, and it was $225, as I remember, is expensive. Plant, you know what plant derived, that means they come from plants. And the word antimycotic, remember what myco is, right? Fungus. Plant derived antifungals. Whoa. And there's a sentence in here as I read this on my tape the other day, I wanted to share with you guys. It's in the opening, the preface. I love this book to my international audience. We're in 200 countries uh, starting February 4th. And this is a collaboration, uh, collaborative effort with Chinese, the UK, America, um, Indian doctors, and I love this book, which is why I bought it. Did I have $300? Not really. But the title, Plant-Derived Antifungals, I'm hungry for those. In the opening, plant-derived antimycotics, that means antifungals, are attracting the attention of botanists and mycologists because they are natural, comma, cheaper, comma, safer, comma, eco-friendly, comma, and within the reach of current medical community. Now listen to this. For this reason, plant extracts are preferred in the cure of fungal infections. Anybody ever hear of the Kaufman diet? Antifungal diet. I mean, you don't cook spore and ox like a hot dog and put it in a little tiny bun and eat it. We eat real food. If those foods contain phenolic, P-H-E-N-O-L-I-C, phenolic compounds, you're eating tiny, tiny amounts of antifungals. So I, I just want to tell you, and then on top of this, one of, one of the guys I work with here, I love this, hospitals lead by poor example. An assessment of snacks, soda, and junk food available at Veterans Affairs Hospital. And it went into this, the, the vending machines are truly unbelievable. I haven't been to a veteran's hospital. I could go to one, uh, but I haven't been. And then finally this, America's most popular breakfast cereals and the stocks behind them. Breakfast is big business in America. We gobble up $8.5 billion worth of ready-to-eat cereal over the past year. Yet cereal is sometimes contaminated with fungal mycotoxins. I try and teach you that. Uh, folks, this is not going to quit. I pulled up, you can go to my website tonight and uh, review this. Antibiotic resistance. Is it antibiotic abuse or fungal ignorance? I wrote that. The adult in the exam room. Please don't let me, uh, please don't let me change your mind about taking a round of antibiotics if you need to. But you have to make the prudent decision. Because any doctor in America is going to fly antibiotics at you like they're candy. And now you know they don't that antibiotics increase your risk of not only hepatitis, 26 years ago published, but of five, breast, lung, 
colorectal, prostate, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, cancers. So the more antibiotics you take, the more vulnerable you become to those five cancers. And yet, your child is going to be handed an antibiotic when they probably don't need it. I'm just saying, sometimes they do need it. Doug, how do we know? The one question, we never had a pediatric, well, we had a friend of mine who I used to jog with back in the old days, a uh, wonderful guy, and I'm proud to tell you his name. Jay is still alive. I haven't seen Jay in 30 years, but he and I used to have so much fun. Jay Gordon, he's out in uh, Santa Monica, California, and he has a, a practice. He doesn't take new patients. He, he has this really cool practice that just cash flows because all these families pay him to help their children. I love this guy, Dr. Jay Gordon. Um, Jay and I used to talk about the number of antibiotics that are handed out. Somebody must be the adult in that exam room. We are led to believe that the doctor is the adult. The doctor is so busy. Well, here comes patient 56 today and then patient 57. Doctor, don't leave. Janie is running a little bit late. Thank you. Janie is running a little bit late. Um, could you stay till 7 tonight? Hello, honey. Forget dinner. Janie is running a little bit late and her child has 103 fever. I'm going to have to put her on an antibiotic. This, I don't want to make light of the doctor's obsession with prescribing. He better. He better. That's what drug company employees taught him. I don't want to become obsessive about this. I want you to be knowledgeable that the road forks. And the one question I would ask if, if I had a child and took him to a pediatrician is, hey, doc, he's been, it's holiday time. He's had fudge from grandma. He's been eating foods he doesn't normally eat. Could that have contributed to his flu? No, because the doctor would say no. Um, is there a way around taking an antibiotic? Could I take it? And if I could give him tepid sponge baths, you know, cool sponge baths, I'll sit in there with him uh, for half an hour and keep his shoulders and his neck and his back cool. I'll put a little car in the tub and so he can play with it, a little rubber ducky, make him happy, sing him to sleep, read him a good story, a Bible story, um, lay down with him, check his fever. Do you remember that when you were parents? Man, we were with those kids full time if they ever had a nose drippy or anything. But my wife breastfed, and she breastfed for over a year. And that meant that when they had inner ear infections or a little pink eye or sinus infections, all she did was lean forward and express a little breast milk into the nose, into the ear, into the eye. Oh, they cried, but then we held them and we loved them. And I'm telling you, God's antibiotic is breast milk. La Leche League could probably make a lot of money uh, selling breast milk uh, as an antibiotic. Uh, skinny cows and transsexual fish. For decades, antibiotics have been infused into agricultural animals or their food. We're told these antibiotics were essential to prevent infections in the animal. But then the truth came along. They actually fatten the animal. Read that. Skinny cows and transsexual fish. This is what we're ending up with now in our food supply. Or if we didn't use drugs. Rocket science and ear infections. In 2009, the British Medical Journal discovered that mo the most common antibiotic drug prescribed for childhood inner ear infections, amoxicillin, actually increased the likeliness of him getting a second. Ta-da. Chick-ching. 20% chance, one in five, are going to be back wanting more antibiotics. Did you find me someone? Yeah. You did? No, I mean, did you find me someone? <laughs> for the gift? Remember what we talked about before I went on? There's so many things, folks. We are, everybody here is a godsend to me. These folks are jumping through hoops. John was here Sunday. Um, I have a lot of educating to do with a brand new audience in over 200 countries. Imagine the responsibility. John, what was it on the shirt I, <clears throat> the shirt I just worked out in? I'm the wretch. God uses, John and Joy, his wife, bought me a shirt a few years ago, and I just went out and worked out in it, and it's kind of wet. Um, but it said, God uses wretches like me. I am living proof that God is on the throne, and he is still using wretches to get his work done. Here I am. Dr. Oz didn't get this. Here's Doug Kaufman, 
a, a little kid that he blew dry from surfing in Manhattan Beach, <sighs> blew me dry, gave me a beautiful wife and two wonderful kids, dropped me into Texas where I met John and these wonderful guys that work here with me. Um, and now that we've really captured America uh, with all of the distribution into 80 million households in America and going strong, along comes a guy a year ago and said, you know, my wife has followed you and loves you. Have you ever considered going global? And uh, folks, we worked it out. And I should say God worked it out. And uh, effective Monday the 4th, if you get DirecTV, remember those of you who called in on DirecTV? Because God TV is on DirecTV. It's not on Dish. It's not anywhere else in the U.S. I wish it was. Uh, but um, I can't believe my show will be in half a billion households throughout India, France, Germany, Vietnam, you know, uh, throughout England, the UK, Australia, these incredible countries, the show is going to air in. So it's a big responsibility. We understand that God does use his wretch, uh, and he'll use a wretch like me to get his work done. So thank you for watching this. Thank you for enabling me to share my almost 50 years of work with you. And thank God that I can still talk and my brain still works. And this is the year I turned 70. And I feel, you know, amazing. I really feel 35 years old. That's not to say I won't drop dead tomorrow, but uh, I have a lot of work to do. Now, uh, your questions are important. I'll get to those. This time I'm going to start with all of my good buddies on YouTube. <laughs> it's perfect aim. Do you get to read these, John? You don't see these, but I know the guys in the other booths do. Doctor's offices don't even answer the phones now. You have to leave a message, and they might try and get back with you. Yeah, but Amy, I'm trying... Can you understand two, three hundred patients a week? Some of them are bleeding, have pussy sores on their body. Some of them are so sick they're ready to die. I have to go to the hospital. I mean, guys, here's what I ask you to do. And my wife, of course, as always, is right. Um, we can't blame them. If they seem rude, you would be too. Folks, I got, oops, I'm not a doctor anymore. I got to the point where we were seeing at Medical City with the doctors I worked with. They had me seeing three or four people a day, 10 people a day, 20 people a day. And I'm telling you, I never spent two minutes with one of their patients. I'd spend a half an hour. And I would be the last one to leave and I'd drive home and the kids would want to play with me. And um, I, I, I've been there. I couldn't do it with 20. How they do it with 30, 40, 50, I don't know. Forgive them. Learn how to get well on your own. It's really important. And according to books, you can do it, some of you. Some of you are so far into disease, and that's where I hope to help you. Um, it's going to take a while. A diet change is the first thing I would do. So thank you, Perfect Dame. My mother-in-law was just diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. I'm wondering if you have any information or suggestions to share. Thanks for all you do. D, um, yeah, this is a bad one. Pancreatic cancer has a high mortality rate. Uh, she's got to get very, very proactive. Oh, I just got to tell you some of the things I do. Um, I, first and foremost is I would ask the doctor to prescribe couple hundred milligrams of Spornox twice a day. Second, along with that, I would stop feeding if this pancreatic cancer is a misdiagnosis. I don't know if it is. And if it is due to fungus or their mycotoxins, Spornox is going to be great. But they're going to keep eating as long as she keeps eating corn biscuits, you know, whatever she's eating. So starve them. Go on the Kaufman diet. Uh, D, I see you got us through live at knowthecause.com. I'd like to... Uh, send her, if we could, the cancer book just as soon as possible, uh, The Fungus Link to Cancer, and let you read, as a registered nurse who is an oncology nurse, 
an oncology pharmaceutical salesperson, a physician and I uh, wrote a little manuscript, 40, 50 pages, of what we would do if we were diagnosed with cancer. You need that book. I'll get that to you right away. Uh, send us a mailing address, uh, and you can put Dear Jordan. Jordan answers all these questions. So my buddy Jordan, um, here's my address. My name is D, and I'll get you this tomorrow. I'll sign it and get it out to you. There's a bunch of stuff I would do if I were you. A lot of it is covered in that book. What you need to do is buy time. If in 90 days she's still alive and looking stronger, they do tumor markers, they can do blood tests to see how the pancreatic cancer is doing. And I would hope to see the tumor markers begin to decline if this wasn't, in fact, pancreatic cancer. <clears throat> Uh, Diana says, okay, Doug, uh, hi, Doug, I've been having a dry cough for two weeks, and when it was wet, then having a hard time breathing, I have a chest, okay, I answered this the other day. Uh, I had a chest x-ray, and they said it was pneumonia. They put me on antibiotics and a, pu a puffer. I want to do things naturally. One of the antibiotics is making me nauseous. I called the nurse, and she told me to stop it, but then she told me to keep taking the other one. If this is a fungal issue, what should I do to build up my immune system? Um, I don't know where you live, Diana. If I had this condition, remember I did a year ago, a little over a year ago. I was traveling every day, lecturing. It was so much fun lecturing to all the doctors, but I was, I'd go back up into my hotel room and I'd shiver and I'd take a bath instead of a shower. That warm water felt so good. And I'd drink, 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 drink bottled water, vitamin C. Um, and I came home so sick after that flight, I had to go on an antibiotic for a couple of days. Um, so I understand exactly where you are. If I didn't improve, I'd get a bronchoscopy done. I'd let somebody go in and take a little chip of that gunk <clears throat> in my lungs and diagnose it. It takes a week or 10 days to grow it out on a Petri dish. And the lab tech, the mycology tech, can not only discern that it's fungal, but then they can break it down into which fungal species it is because some antifungals work better. Uh, Candida albicans and the Candida family uh, work quite well with Diflucan, whereas other yeast, Cryptococcus and other fungi, work quite well with Spornox. That's why I think cancer does so well with the drug called Spornox because it's not necessarily Candida. Could be other, or well, we know, Aspergillus. Uh, gives off a poison called aflatoxin that causes human liver cancer. Theta complete, done. No doctor can say it doesn't. It's published in all his journals. Um, so you have to be very, very careful. Um, and if I, gosh, you know, I got a friend out here who does intravenous vitamin C. I would go have, you know, 25, 30 grams. He'll know what to give you. But I'd go to a local doctor. Do you know in our little beach town, Manhattan Beach, California, where we used to live, we got married out there and, and lived, and then we could no longer afford it. Um, the homes out there, a small home is a million and a half to two million dollars. But um, we've sent friends right down uh, on a, where all the people walk to the beach. You see every sandal, every swimming trunk, every surfboard in the world. Uh, Pier Avenue, it's called. There is now an IV center. There's nurses and a doctor in there, and you can surf all day. <laughs> I wish I'd have had this accessible to me many years ago. When you surf all day, you are physically drained. I wish I could have walked up Pier Avenue and gotten an IV of vitamin C and B vitamins and so forth. I think I would have, and they're a hundred bucks. You know, they're not expensive. Look into things like that. I know we're all hoping to avoid antibiotics. Antibiotics can be lifesavers, just so you're aware. An educated consumer is the best, and especially in medicine. If you know that this might be a fungal infection, fungal pneumonia, her name is Carol Kaufman, no kin to me. Carol Kaufman, I've seen her lecture. Her whole thing is on fungal pneumonia and yet 100% of them are, di are misdiagnosed as bacterial pneumonia. Be careful. Are the antibiotics really doing their thing? If in three days you're feeling much better, they're doing their thing. If in three days you're feeling much worse, I'd talk to the doctor about going on Spornox or Diflucan instead of these antibiotics. Okay? Thank you. <clears throat> okay, uh, let's see. Hi, Doug. Your phase one diet shows that no tea is allowed. However, I see that you are drinking big, <laughs> big low mint medley on your show. Is this tea allowed? It certainly is. Uh, and if so, are all herbal teas allowed? Read that section again on herbal teas. Some are and some aren't. Certainly herbs, which are antifungal, 
are allowed on the diet. Those that aren't allowed on the Kaufman 1 are allowed often on the Kaufman 2. But there are some teas, kombucha is one of them, that isn't allowed at all. I salute you, Lori. Thanks. Good question. <clears throat> Marva, my buddy Marva. Uh, Grandy, Happy New Year's, Doug. I mentioned a few weeks ago that I ordered my PATH report. There were several tissues biopsied, cervical, vagina, uterus. I had a mass on the cervix. It was diagnosed as cervical dysplasia and or friable cervix. But three days later, my final report states uterine cancer. Wow. On the final report, it specifies as section C, the cervix, was not completely con conclusive of type or origin. Can you please share your knowledge on this? Uh, okay, I was done a cervical dysplasia. This is, I wonder if they've done a colposcopic uh, exam. Uh, Marva, I'd have to know more information on this, but it was not completely conclusive of type of origin. Okay, here's Marva. This frustrates me. Fortunately, it doesn't frustrate anybody else in the medical field, but I taught yesterday on this new network I'm on that a mammogram, first of all, I questioned, is, it okay? is radiation carcinogenic? Because all of the federal government uh, rule makers say radiation is a category one carcinogen. It causes cancer. Then why do we smash a breast and shoot radiation through it a couple times a year or once a year. We are told uh, by uh, radiologists and, and the people who invest money to make money on these mammogram machines that, oh, it's, it's the same thing as I'm standing at TSA. I spoke to a young woman the other day as I'm in Orlando. Uh, she's leaning on 2SA machines where you go in and do that. I said, don't you worry about your exposure? And she said, no, <clears throat> we're told it's only as toxic as a dental x-ray. Boy, I would love to trust like that. I would love to trust like that. Um, and I don't know that it isn't, but I know I don't like dental x-rays, okay? I don't like radiation at all. I avoid it. I don't have one of those, what are those cookers in your house? What are those called uh, where you push a button? Microwave, thank you, John. I don't even have one of those. Um, I just try and avoid it. And I know I might be a little paranoid to many of you, but look, with Wi-Fi, with, with cell phones, you know, with all of the things we're doing today, um, minimizing your exposure to things we know cause cancer is a good idea. So a mammogram, first we're shooting radium or we're, we're sh taking an X-ray of a breast by smashing it, right? Number two, a mammogram, you may not know this, but I'm going to tell you the truth. Mammograms show a 42% false positive. Ooh, you have breast cancer. No, you didn't. Or false negative. Now nah, you're fine. Wow, I got cancer. 58%? Where's that coin? That's 58%. Are we told? Folks, here's where I'm lost. Are we told before we go in that it might come back, you have a pretty good chance of it coming back positive and you don't have it. Same with cervical. You know, we're looking at pap smears today and saying, wow, they need some work on their, uh, on, on their uh, accuracy also, just like the mammogram. And so we're looking for new ways and there's new ways coming out all the time. Um, by the way, I'm doing a blog that I think you guys will like. Uh, cervical cancer is one of those that's really falling through the past 15, 20 years. And there was a report that came out on uh, PubMed or one of these big, that women are not getting pap smears. And those women of 21 to 40 years old, shame on you. Only 50% of you. Are. And then in the same breath almost, they're saying cervical cancer is going down. The other day I saw and I brought to you, I don't think it was here, I think I brought it on TV. Uh, 40 to 50% of people aren't getting flu shot this year. And of course they're shocked. <gasps> what was that celebrity thing you said you watched the other night, John? Something on TV where celebrities were getting flu shots? Oh, maybe it was one of the other guys. Was there some celebrity thing on TV, on network TV? I wouldn't have watched it, but um, they came out with needles or fake needles and they were giving the celebrities flu shots. They're, 
Obviously, folks, they're trying to promote flu shots. But the fact is, an article came out 40, 50% of people, or 40% anyway, aren't getting them. And where was the flu? Now, all of a sudden, the past couple of weeks, oh, this flu is killing people. It's just, when you're stating that, um, when you're stating that nobody's getting flu shot, you better follow up and say, boy, we got, this is horrible. The flu is worse than it's ever been, okay? And same with some of my other findings. When, when you're saying mammogram is this perfect test, you need to know the truth. Fact is, it's less than 60 per... Were you ever in high school? Did you ever get embarrassed when the teacher walked by your desk and he or she would put your paper graded test result face down. Oh, that happened to me more often than not. And you turned over and it says 58. Was that an A? It was an F. And yet every woman in the world is told they better get a mammogram. I'm just saying. All I'm giving you today are facts. There may, many of you watching this show right now are saying, you know, mammogram saved my life. Fantastic. God bless you. That's good. Many men say, you know, Doug, the PSA saved my life. <laughs> wow, you guys are you guys are awesome. Um, wow, that's really that's really good, uh, Marva. What would I do? Okay, I like a vaginal insert called Gynatren, G Y N A T R E N, uh, made by a company out in California. Natren, N-A-T-R-E-N, um, sometimes dysplasia or, or changing cells are changing. Uh, what have we done to change them? I'm, look, I'm totally convinced, and it's chapter three in my new woman's book, are we passing this back and forth? If you're enjoying a healthy sexual relationship and it's monogamous uh, with your spouse, I think sometimes we grow fungus on our skin, every part of our skin. And sometimes that can end up uh, on a cervix. And uh, sometimes that's called, at least they're shining the red light. Ooh, be careful, this could be cancer. I hate that word cancer. I think it is being abused like antibiotics are being abused in America today. Put the fear of the Lord in me by mentioning those six letters, C-A-N-C-E-R. And very often they do that. Not meaning to be mean, just meaning to cover their rears, okay? Michelle Sion, and I like the way she spells this, M-I-C-H-E-L-E, Sion. I'm getting ready for radiation to shrink a brain tumor. I have been on antibiotics since March, wow. I'm now on steroids for adrenal insufficiency. What can I do to improve my immune system? I've had two craniac uh, craniectomies, maybe. It's not cancer, I've had two tests and it's not cancer. I have been on, been getting radiation, thank you. I've been getting radiation for cancer to shrink a brain tumor. I've been on antibiotics since March. That's almost a year and I'm now on steroids for adrenal insufficiency. What can I do to improve my immune system? I've had two cr craniectomies and it's not cancer. Okay, Michelle, ta-da! This is going off to you, Michelle. If you'll do me a favor, there is so much information on cancer and so many more things. The diet, natural antifungals, prescriptive antifungals that Dr. Holland and I wrote in these books many, many years ago. This is a guy, I love this guy. At a church I used to go to, he is the, uh, he is the music director who did this. <clears throat> And uh, his voice is so soft and masculine that we paid him to voice these books many years ago. This is coming to you. Uh, go on my website, type into the search engine in my blogs, cancer. Go to YouTube. What was the name of that thing I did so many years ago? One Man's Hypothesis. One Man's Hypothesis of Cancer. I don't know where that is, but I bet it's got over 50,000 uh, views now. One man's hypothesis of what cancer is. I think that could help. Michelle, if you'll uh, go to, uh, was she YouTube, Facebook? I'm sorry, YouTube? Facebook, okay. So you know how to get in touch with us. Get us your address. I'll, how am I gonna sign that? It's black. I'll figure that out. 
I'll get that right off to you. And thank you guys back there for your large hearts. Connie says, thanks, Doug, for being there for us. Thank you, Connie. YouTube chat. Uh, Sonogram, Maria says, I have a seven millimeter lesion on my left kidney. What could it be? You see, this is cool because your doctor didn't say, oh, throw the C word at you. Seven millimeter on your kidney. Remember what the kidney does. While you're sleeping, it's filtering your blood. What could be blocking up that kidney? What could be so thick in your blood that it's causing these pores to not filter properly? Now it's ending up on the surface of the kidney. Um, boy, I like chlorophyll. Um, you know, the, uh, I would drink a glass of, you know, 10 drops of chloroxygen, which is a good product, uh, a couple of times a day. Uh, I would change my diet radically to the Kaufman One diet, and in 30 days, I would go back and say, I want another test. Thank you, Marie. Prevention, uh, for, prevention for influenza other than the vaccine. We've already had three cases at work. Um, Sylvia, I like and I take, this year I use my head, I take beta-glucan. Um, I got to tell you, if you're trying to prevent it, just sucking on one of these lozenges, uh, it, the Optivita, this is what John took. He's got this beautiful little grandson who had a snotty nose and he was climbing all over his face. Me too. Oh, I didn't climb on his face. My grandsons climbed on my face too. And uh, this is silver solution. Only uh, this is a, Opta Silver is a nano silver that's bound onto water. So you don't have to shake it up or anything. Uh, they also have lozenges. They have curcumin. They have hemp. They have topical hemp for skin. This company, I'm so proud of my of them coming to me and saying, we have these incredible products, would you help us get them out there? They are a paid sponsor of my TV show, Know the Cause. Beta Glucan, also Frank, the owner of that company, is one of my paid advertisers, who, both of whom's product I believe in, I have them at home and I take them. Beta Glucan, I think, has been for years, a couple of decades, my best chance at preventing the cold and flu. I hadn't had one for decades until I didn't reorder from Frank uh, and I started on this travel across America toward the end of last year for months and months and months. Lectured, I went to Ty and Charlene Bollinger's uh, lecture, uh, uh, cancer lecture. I spoke at that and I was honored to speak at many of these uh, lectures. By the way, there's a seminar coming up, John. Dr. Christensen, she's an OBGYN. She says in October, there's so many people interviewing me now. I, have no, I was on the radio the other night. Uh, I have no idea how many interviews I've done, but fungus is hot right now. And I plan on marching it through 100% till God takes me home. Um, I started this thing almost 50 years ago. I'm one of them. And I'm not going to quit until doctors are acknowledging that antibiotics or mycotoxins were abusing them and I think sometimes people by overprescribing them and putting people on a fungus poison. How good is that for a 13 month old? Sometimes it can be life saving. Be prudent, mom, be prudent. Ask the question, can I go a night or two, tepid sponge baths, a lot of breast milk, um, a lot of water, even apple juice. I know, you know, maybe that's not the best thing in the world, but hydrate that child. Okay, so I, uh, Sylvia, thank you. Uh, three cases at work, I would, I use beta-glucan. I take a 10 milligram in the morning and a 10 milligram in the evening before I go to bed. You want some free? Just go to nsc24.com. They'll send you a package. They pay postage. They'll send you some free for you to try. Uh, Susan, a good doctor would work his way out of a job. <laughs> do you love, do you love how like-minded? I mean, yeah, thank you. That's true. If fungus ever finds its way into doctor's offices, it's going to be a problem. Uh, why do some people, Rosa, this is a good question. Why do some people say fermented foods are good for you? Isn't wine and beer fermented food? I'm confused. Are all grains contaminated? Good question. Uh, the U.S. is the number third most contaminated feed grains. Now, little book, little book, little book. Okay, that's a good one, but where was this other book? Come on, Doug, you can do it. 
Uh, this is one of the good books. I was wondering if I had Dr. Christensen's book here. Uh, grain storage, nope. Okay, John, see if we can show this. This is a book anybody can buy, Mycotoxins. This book is put out by CAST, the Council for Agricultural Science and Technology. This book is alarming because it said our grain supply is pretty commonly contaminated. It's put out in Iowa. Um, we have a problem. I would say no to your question, Do all, are all grains contaminated with mycotoxins? But we have a heck of a problem in America with them. Um, why do some people say fermented foods are good? I believe that bacteria, bacterial ferments are a good thing. When I think of bacterial ferments, I think of sauerkraut. I think of yogurt, uh, bacterial ferments. And you're right, Rosa. I'm uh, Rose. Rosa. When I think of yeast ferments, I think of alcohol, ethanol. You know. Um, by the way, people who work on cars tell me that all the bushings in the engine and all the. Uh, thank you, John. And by the way, we're going to continue this. This is so important conversation tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. Is today Tuesday or Thursday? Tuesday. Man, the holiday totally messed me up. I'm never giving you guys a Monday off again. Um, so we'll be back at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. And uh, uh, Silvana, oh, for my friend who has MS. Okay, Silvana, until we can talk tomorrow, go to the internet, go to my website and type in multiple sclerosis, a chronic mycotoxicosis, big name, M-Y-C-O-T-O-X-I-C-O-S-E-S. Is MS a chronic mycotoxicosis? Any search engine, use Google, any of them. Is multiple sclerosis a chronic mycotoxicosis? My friend Joe Mercola, who we had on TV here recently, um, he was the first to air that when Dave and I wrote that in 2002 or 2003. We provide significant data that MS, sphingolipid uh, proteins, are enhanced with mycotoxins. I'm sorry, sphingolipid proteins, are, mycotoxins are responsible for these proteins. MS and fungal diseases have much to do with one another, and I'll talk more on that tomorrow. Uh, so Rosa, bacterial ferments I like. Don't like kefir? I shouldn't say I don't like kefir. Uh, kefir and kombucha and mushrooms are all good. Science is publishing more and more data to show that there are fractions of mushrooms and kombucha. You know, I used to go in a little health food store in Temple, Texas that had that much information on kombucha. Now they have two frozen or cold aisles, refrigerated aisles with kombucha. People are taking it. They're getting over some of their tummy symptoms, some of their sinus problems. I think it's all hair of the dog. I think if a yeast or a fungus or a mushroom helps you, then the etiology, then, then what you are suffering from, be they blepharospasms, eye twitches, uh, horrible constipation, joint problems, depression, crying, hair falling out, if those fungal products and ethanol help, what did we learn from homeopathic remedies? They treat like for like what causes cures. And so I think the reason we're finding fractions of mushrooms help people with cancer, I'm all for that. But I think then that just confirms my work, that cancer is a mushroom. Cancer is a fungus, okay? So hold that thought. Uh, I recently read, says Connie, that cereal is loaded with Roundup. I gotta tell you, um, you know, it's funny because uh, Berkeley, my little four-year-old, God, that is the cutest kid. He and his brother, I can't get over them. The parents went out, mom and dad went out on New Year's and they rented a hotel room, beautiful place that sits out on the water. And they asked us if we could stay with the boys. Uh, the youngest boy who's one year old obviously missed mom and dad and um, it was up all night. Uh, and so Ruth and I, I didn't even wake up till three. I laid down with the other one, Berkeley, and went to sleep and at three I heard the baby crying so I got up and Ruth was bouncing on her, you know, walking around and being with him. Um, those are the cutest kids in the world. Mom gives them uh, a little type of cereal, Odeos or something like that, and man, they eat those dry. Uh, just amazing. Be careful with all grains. Thank you. 
you're welcome, that's yours. Please do me a favor, try that. This, this is one of the producers here, Clay, um, and he's, he's been on pain medication for a long time, he's now off, and so I gave him the hemp to try. All you can do is try. I think you're gonna love that. Give it a try. If you don't, give it back to me, I'll sell it. I'll put it on eBay and say, <laughs> no. Uh, thanks for your help today, that was a great day. Um, okay, so here's Marsha, thanks, we got through this. Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. Those I didn't answer today, tape, or I tape it. Listen tomorrow evening when you get home from work. I'm on live from 10 to 11. Uh, Marsha says, you are amazing. Oh, thank you, Marsha. I'm in classes to maintain my ND. So folks, an ND, Doug's humble opinion, doctor of the future. Naturopathic doctor, this takes a lot of schooling, a lot of brains to get through, but they learn about natural approaches. They don't learn about surgery and pill prescribing. I hate to be this way, but I think everything in the world has a cycle. And I know all good intentions were when we could finally erase a bacterial infection with an antibiotic, but for gosh sakes, that was 1928. Here we are a hundred years later, still trying to erase every infection with an antibiotic and we're wrong. Many of the infections, if not most, are fungal. And we're contributing to health problems with our antibiotics, my take on that. So Marcia is becoming, uh, you are amazing, I'm in classes to maintain my ND. She already is a naturopathic doctor. Cancer is my specialty. God led me to this field after my husband passed from a glioblastoma. Teach me so I can help others. Uh, thanks for blessing us. Okay, so uh, Marcia, if you'll give us a mailing address, uh, uh, live at knowthecause.com, I wanna send you some of the books. Uh, you're exactly who I wanna teach. If I give Marcia a fish, she eats today. If I teach Marcia that many of the patients she's seeing with cancer have a fungal condition, and sometimes, folks, if you can get rid of the fungus, what does fungus do? It's immunosuppressive. So these cancer patients just go down, down, down. If I can teach Marcia to fish, she helps a huge number of patients. Okay, I need to tell about my friend, Dave. I talked about him some time ago. Uh, Dave was told by someone who loved, he loved, he's 62 years old, he was told to get to a doctor this time. You haven't had a checkup in 20 years, Dave. Go to a doctor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He finally went. And he went to a prostate cancer specialist. You take your prostate into a prostate cancer specialist. What's he going to find? Okay, just my take. I'm sorry. I know I seem cynical. Sure enough, they not only found a lump on his prostate. By the way, a gloved digital rectal exam done by a doctor in the rectum of a male is 1% accurate. And the way it was taught to me by the doctor who invented the PSA, one of my favorite books, The Great Prostate Hoax. Every man, please, and every woman who loves a man, pick up this book, The Great Prostate Hoax by Dick Ablin. Dr. Richard Ablin, who's a buddy of mine, wrote me the nicest Christmas card. How do, what's a doctor's finger do once in there, right? So you got this prostate, the urethra of the male, the urine tube goes right through the prostate. So what he does is feel with that finger and if it feels like this, make a, make a fist like that. Feel that knot on your thumb? That's what a node, a nodule on the prostate feels like. Well, Doug, what does it feel like? And I asked Dick Ablin this, you know, what does it feel like if you don't have a nodule on your prostate? Okay, now, Open your hand, now close it tight like that. Now feel that little bump, nice and smooth, right? Right there between your thumb and your first digit. That's what it feels like if you don't. So my friend goes to a cancer specialist. They do a PSA test on him, it's five. He's 62, I don't think that's abnormal. The doctor did. So he then did 16 biopsies on the guy, clipped his urethra mistakenly and he bled urine, he, he urinated blood. I mean, the long and the short of it is, six, eight months later, I sent him to a doctor friend, I helped him with his diet, and he called me the other day emotional, he's a great guy, he's a 
he's a, an amazing man, that he had been to the Mayo Clinic and the Mayo Clinic called him the other day and he is cancer free. Can I tell you, I had no part nor did my doctor friend in curing that because it wasn't cured. I believe it was fungus the whole time and we starved it and we help kill the fungus and now the symptom or symptoms of cancer have dissipated and the prostate biopsy this time, all negative, benign. Amen. Okay. Tomorrow, I want to continue on this. This is really, really good stuff. Marcia, congratulations. Thank you for being a naturopathic doctor with an open mind. Uh, like me on Facebook or like me on YouTube. No, like me on Facebook. Ring my bell on YouTube. You guys are doing great. God bless you. Uh, more tomorrow at 10 a.m. I'll be back. Brush teeth, all refreshed. See you then. Bye bye.